uh, dear Deputy Prime Minister Markovic, ministers, ambassadors, excellencies, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, I feel, of course, privileged today to have this opportunity to address you and join your discussions on how to overcome one of the most persistent human rights challenges of our time, namely how to end hate crime and violence. 25 years ago, almost to the day, the World Health Organization struck out homosexuality from its international classification of diseases, thus ending a century of medical homophobia. The Interna International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and uh, Biphobia is the day when we take the stock of the progress we have made so far in ensuring equality in human rights and human dignity for all LGBT people. And in Tis the Day, when we review the challenges ahead. It is the moment to speak out against the homophobia and discrimination which still stalk our continent and our world. It is the moment to renew our commitment to building on the progress made. It is the moment to remind states of their obligation to protect, promote and fulfill universal rights without discrimination. Today, we do indeed have many reasons to celebrate. To celebrate the progress made in safeguarding the human rights and dignity of all LGBT uh, citizens. And I should say huge, huge strides have been made. Homosexual acts have now been decriminalized throughout Europe. This was long and hard won battle. And I'm proud of your contribution, of state's contribution, and of course of Council of Europe's work in this field. In the early 80s, the Council of Europe worked on establishing the foundations of what are today considered to be, shall I say great achievements, but at least achievements. These changes did not happen overnight. They were inspired and made possible thanks to the evolution of our societies. The hard work of human rights defenders and, of course, better understanding of diversity and better understanding of human rights. Recent legislative and policy developments concerning equal rights of LGBT people are a striking example of this progress. Such developments, unimaginable a de decade ago, are not the result of, say, fashionable policies or the wish to create new or special rights, as some argue. They indeed stem from the need to protect the human rights that people have always had. Last year, during the Idaho Forum in Malta, Prime Minister Muscat announced revolutionary changes to protect and promote human rights for LGBT people. Well, he kept his promise. Recently, Malta made global news with its groundbreaking law, which all allows for a quick, transparent, and accessible gender recognition procedure for trans people and respect the physical integrity of both trans and intersex people. As many of you already know, five years ago, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe adopted its groundbreaking recommendation on measures to combat discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. Deputy Prime Minister Markovic mentioned that in the concrete example in use here in our host state. In human rights terms, this was the world's first policy instrument, specifically focusing on sexual orientation and gender identity. 
It was also the first instrument setting out standards regarding the rights of transgender people. It gave the Council of Europe's 47 member states a solid policy tool for combating discrimination and reinforcing the rights of LGBT people. The adoption of this recommendation has helped inspire legal and political reforms. In particular, it has helped member states identify improvements which need to be made to ensure LGBT people do not face discrimination in accessing their human rights. Nonetheless, hate crime and violence persist. Every day we hear of homophobic and transphobic incidents, so-called corrective rapes, forced marriages, physical and emotional violence, family and community rejection, bullying and discrimination against LGBT people. Too often, such a violence remains invisible, going unreported to human rights organizations, state institutions, as well as the wider public. Sometimes these incidents are even ignored by the authorities responsible for protecting the victims. We need to recognize that violence and discrimination against LGBT people are not isolated incidents. They are part of everyday reality that LGBT people face. Bias-motivated crimes have one common element. They are the expression of deep-rooted negative feelings and attitudes towards LGBT people. So let's be clear about this. Neither cultural, traditional, nor religious values, nor the rules of dominant culture can justify criminal acts and violent crimes. This is a fundamental human rights principle enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights. LGBT rights are human rights and vice versa. Human rights are LGBT rights. So, what are the right responses to discrimination and violence against LGBT fellow citizens? I'll try to list some of them. First, we need to have appropriate legal and policy framework in place, built on solid data and a, on a better analysis of biased motivated crimes. Second, we need to make sure that the professionals, including law enforcement officers, have the necessary skills and knowledge to respond to hate crime. Third, we need to ensure that victims are aware of their rights and can trust the authorities to enforce them. Fourth, and finally, political leaders. Political leaders must show political courage. They must speak out, condemn all acts of violence and all bias-motivated crimes and endorse and promote the human rights principle we all share. With this in mind, we at the Council of Europe are ready to pay, play our part. We can, and indeed we do, provide support and expertise upon request to member states to improve their legal, regulatory and institutional frameworks, as well as to train officials and share good practice. We are supporting dialogue and cooperation between governments and LGBT civil society organizations. We are promoting awareness raising measures in favor of the human rights of LGBTI people and of our common standards. 
We do so through cooperation with our partners, such as the EU, the OSCE, the UN and civil society organizations, to ensure that we share a common approach and that our work has a stronger impact. Let me take this opportunity to welcome the efforts made in this area by our, by our host country. Montenegro has shown its strong commitment to tackling violence and discrimination through this conference, through many measures, but notably in the framework of its national strategy for improving the quality of life of LGBT people. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, progress, as we see, has been made. We are heading towards guaranteed universal human rights for everyone, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. But the road ahead is a long one. And sometimes, in some countries, governments stop, turn around, and start driving back the wrong way. Laws banning the propaganda on non-traditional sexual rel relations have been introduced to limit open, free, and factual public discussions on sexual orientation and gender identity. These laws stop young people from gaining access to unbiased information. These laws have led to arrests and prosecution of individuals at public events and including journalists. These laws are incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, at least according to the Council of Europe's Venice Commission. I want you to know that the Council of Europe, as Europe's leading human rights organization, is your partner, your friend, and your supporter. We will spare no efforts in combating discrimination, in challenging stereotypes, in standing up to violence and hate crimes. We will also spare no efforts in strengthening human rights. With your help, we will build a Europe where our lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and intersex fellow citizens feel safe, feel free, and feel equal. So we must prevent Europe from backtracking. We must keep going in the right direction. And going in the right direction together. In equality and dignity. Thank you.